I don't want to let this Uvalde police story die because it's important for the public to come to the stark realization that number one, police departments are infested with high ranking officials who lie and spin the truth regarding their interactions with the public. And if they're going to lie about this Uvalde thing, and they did, when it first came out, the cops were doing nothing but concocting lies to make themselves look good amidst a tragic situation. Number two, that generally speaking, cops really aren't here to serve and protect you because if they're not going to protect the weakest among us, kids in a school whose lives are in jeopardy, do you think they're really going to protect you in your hour of need? And number three, this few bad apples fairy tale is just that. It's a fictitious ploy to get us to believe that there's not a systemic problem in law enforcement. This is an article from the New York Slimes, and if you're getting exposed by the New York Slimes, your life has taken a dramatic turn in the wrong direction. They say a grand jury in Uvalde is set to examine response to school massacre. I don't know what kind of examination they're looking to pinpoint because we have the video evidence of what the cops didn't do standing down for 77 minutes while a gunman was having his way with children in a school behind a door that ended up not being locked these cowardly cops could have got in there some way somehow if they wanted to but they didn't because they're not here to serve and protect like they say they are, like most American lemmings believe that they're there for. I mean, they had one job and they didn't do it. it says prosecutors are slated to begin presenting evidence to a panel days after the, ju- the Injustice Department report found that unimaginable and cascading failures hindered the police response to the shooting. But I want to point out a couple things here because it's pretty interesting to note how the fake stream CIA infiltrated Operation Mockingbird MK Ultra Media is spinning this, still not wanting to go to the extent of saying, yeah, here's how corrupt police departments actually are. And if you if you question how bad police departments are, look at the biggest police force on the planet today, the NYPD, the New York City Police Department. Back in the 70s, there was a NAP commission that investigated and found that from top to bottom, the NYPD was corrupt. 20 years later, in 1994, the Mullen Commission determined the same thing, concluding, hey, you remember the uh, bad stuff that the NAP commission uncovered? Well, it's way worse now, 20 years down the road. And you think any police department is going to get better Absolutely not. When you hand a guy a uniform, a badge, and a gun, and the authority of the state, and qualified immunity, and hey, you can hide behind Terry v. Ohio, and all this kind of stuff, do you really expect a person who is drawn to the corrupt policing practice to be a better person at the end of a year, or two years, or 10 or 20 years? The district attorney in Uvalde, Texas, has said for months that she intended to convene a grand jury to consider evidence from the 2022 shooting at Robb Elementary School with the possibility that state criminal charges could result over the botched police response to the massacre. You know why this is not going to happen? Stay tuned. I'll tell you why. Because the Supreme Court has basically said, no, you're not going to do this. And we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at two cases, one in specific, and we'll look at the specific reason that if I was a defense attorney for the cops, I would pull out both of these cases, specifically one of them. I would drill down and I would show, well, you can't prosecute my guys, my thin blue line guys, because they have the blessing of the Supreme Court to not do what they didn't do. The district attorney said in an email in December that she would, quote, dissect the investigation of the Texas Rangers in the shooting and then, quote, presents the same to the Uvalde County Grand Jury for review. On Friday, it emerged that the selection for the grand jury had begun, said word that the jury had begun to be convened, came a day after the Injustice Department published a 600-page report that found broad and unimaginable failures that delayed the response and subsequent medical care to the victims after the mass shooting. The probe by this person 
had been anticipated by the family members of the victims and survivors of the shooting who have long said that a near total breakdown in policing protocols by 300, it's actually 376 police officers may have worsened the outcome of a shooting that left 19 children and two teachers dead. And the, the next two paragraphs I want to hone in on, and then we're going to take a look at the case that I would use if I was the defense attorney defending these cops in the Thin Blue Line gang. The grand jury could be asked to determine and, and see if you guys can guess what court case, Supreme Court case, I'm going to be using for that. The grand jury could be asked to determine whether any of the officers broke the law by waiting 77 minutes to confront the teenage gunman who was holed up in two connected classrooms while some children from one of the classrooms called 911 for help. And if you've ever, if you've heard those recordings, it is pathetic. And to lay those side by side, lay the 911 call from one of the kids in the classrooms against the hallway video evidence where the cops are absolutely doing nothing and then cut away to the news crew recording the Uvalde police and border patrol stopping parents from going into the classrooms to save their kids by, you know, tripping them, holding them, arresting them and throwing them into the back of their cop cars. While police officers have occasionally been charged and convicted for their actions during fatal encounters, criminal charges against police officers who fail to protect the public remain rare. Yes, they do. Truer words have never been spoken. The law usually does not require people to put themselves in harm's way, even if training instructs them to do so, according to policing experts. And those policing experts are probably hired by the police unions to lay more cover for the Thin Blue Line gang, to get them out of doing the very things the side of their cop car said they would do, and that's to protect and serve. And that's why on a lot of cop cars, when I was growing up, they were on every cop car. Now they're just fading away. They're not even saying protect and serve anymore because they know it's not true. That's not what they're there to do. They're there to generate revenue for the state. Two months before the massacre, officers with the Uvalde School District's police force had gone through active shooter training, which included guidelines that called for them to immediately confront a gunman to stop more bloodshed. Quote, a first responder unwilling to place the lives of the innocent above their own safety should consider another career field, the guidelines read. And that is hypocrisy, because if that guideline comes from the police department, we know that the police department's sole primary goal in any interaction with the public is that that officer goes home safe at the end of his shift. But we go home, protect ourselves, protect our partners. So you're trying to be empathetic at the sacrifice of your officer safety. Officer safety in their minds trumps individual rights. What is the most important thing we got to take care of when we first get any scene? Officer, officer and scene safety. Officer safety trumps your right to be free in, uh, in your person houses, papers and effects. The absolute most important thing is officer safety. So all of the other procedural stuff that they learn will be at their own individual agencies. Officer safety is the number one goal of every cop. And so we really highlight that officer safety issue. I got to get to my family safe. I don't care what happens to you. If I'm going to be safe, I have to understand everything that's going on around me. What happened to our officer safety? Some of the first officers on the scene initially moved toward the door that led into one of the classrooms where the gunman had opened fire, but they were fired upon. At that point, they were captured on camera waiting outside the hallway. The local school police chief had classified the incident as a barricaded subject instead of an active shooter situation. That's convenient which would have called for a more aggressive approach. Federal border agents eventually confronted the gunman and killed him. During a media briefing Thursday in Uvalde, the U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, who wants to use state violence to take your guns because some psychopath on big pharma drugs did something evil with his guns. That's Merrick Garland. So you got the Injustice Department, the corrupt from top to bottom Injustice Department looking into the corrupt police departments that were involved in the Uvalde shooting incident. He said, quote, lives would have been saved and people would have survived if officers had acted faster to confront the gunman. There's just hypocrisy all over the board on this. Mr. Garland said that protocols for responding officers, quote, to immediately enter the room to stop the shooter with whatever weapons and tools the officers have with them. 
Blame for the delayed police confrontation with the gunman has shifted since the day of the shooting. Look at this. Shortly after the tragedy, the top state police official, Steve McCraw, pointed the finger at the local school police chief, Pete Arredondo. Then it turned out that the state police officers were also among those who failed to actively confront the gunman. So here's Steve trying to lay cover for his buddies and then turns out his thin blue line gang members didn't do what they were supposed to do. In its report, the Injustice Department focused largely on decisions by Mr. Arredondo, finding that his actions or decisions delayed the response. Mr. Arredondo, who says he has become, quote, a sacrificial lamb in the situation, has said that he acted to save as many lives as he could. There was no action. There was absolute recorded inaction, including those of students in nearby classrooms who might have been injured by any crossfire. Now, the two cases that I would use if I was a defense attorney for the Thin Blue Line gang, which I would never be, but if I was a corrupt defense attorney, I would use DeShaney versus Winnebago County, and I would use Town of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez. Now, I want to set and contextualize the case of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez because it's very interesting. We're not just talking about kids in a school who are in a in a dire situation and the police show up and then they decide to stand down because they don't want to jeopardize their safety. We are talking in this situation with Mrs. Gonzalez having a strain, restraining order against her ex, Mr. Gonzalez, against coming anywhere near her kids. Look at this. Castle Rock is a United States Supreme Court case in which the court ruled seven to two that a town and its police department could not be sued under 42 USC 1983 for failing to enforce a restraining order. So there was a restraining order in place that the police knew about and the restraining order was violated, which the police also knew about it and they chose to do nothing. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, they can do nothing. They're not obligated to protect you, even if they said that they would protect you with that restraining order. It's just a piece of paper, guys. Don't relax because you have a restraining order. Don't relax because you believe that the Thin Blue Lion Gang is actually going to come to your aid in your hour of need. Which had led to the murders of the woman's three children by her estranged husband. The decision has since become infamous and condemned by several human rights groups. And let me just, let's go over this paragraph right here because I think it's important to contextualize exactly what happened with Jessica Gonzalez. During divorce proceedings, Jessica Gonzalez, a resident of Castle Rock, Colorado, obtained a permanent restraining order against her husband, Simon, who had been stalking her on June 4th, 1999, requiring him to remain at least a hundred yards from her and her four children, son, Jesse, who is not Simon's biological child and daughters, Rebecca, Catherine, and Leslie, except during specific visitation time on June 22nd at approximately 5 15 PM, Simon took possession of the three girls in violation of the order. Jessica called the police at approximately 7 30 PM, 8 30 PM, 10 10 PM, on June 22nd and 12.15 a.m. on June 23rd and visited the police station in person at 12.40 a.m. on June 23rd. Prior to the second call, Simon had called Jessica and stated that he had the daughters with him at an amusement park in Denver, Colorado. However, since Jessica had allowed Simon from time to time to take the children at various hours, the police took no action. At approximately 3.20 a.m. on June 23rd, Simon appeared at the Castle Rock Police Station and was killed in a shootout with officers. A search of his vehicle revealed the dead bodies of the three daughters who were determined to have been killed prior to the arrival at the police station. There was no cause of death found, nor was there a time or place of death. And it's just to reiterate, in this context, the U.S. Supreme Court case Gonzalez versus Castle Rock, the U.S. Supreme Court held in a seven to two decision that cops are not obligated in the context of a permanent restraining order to protect those children that this restraining order was designed to protect. So if you think that this grand jury is going to find any kind of criminal action or charges against these Uvalde cops with the backdrop of this U.S. Supreme Court decision, town of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, you know, I basically have a bridge to say. I got some ice cubes to sell you to some of you Eskimos out there.
it's pretty profound what's happening here. It's pretty amazing that the lemmings continue to be desensitized by this propaganda that cops are are here to save you. They're the protectors and servants of the people. When we've seen with the Uvalde Police Department that we don't have a case of just a few bad apples. The entire system is corrupt from the top from top to bottom. We have officers who can somehow summon the courage after they call for backup at a traffic stop. And the weakest among them will get involved with putting their hands on you after you've been arrested, handcuffed or torture cuffed, and you're laying on the ground and the, his buddies are, are wailing on you. Then that coward's going to get involved. They, they somehow get the courage at a traffic stop to trample over your rights, but they can't find any courage with 376 of them outside of a school while kids are being summarily snuffed out. That's cowardly. That's what's going on here. And that's not just what happened in Uvalde. This happens every single day in the New York Police Department, the Los Angeles Police Department, and Sheriff's Departments across the nation. You are not going to see any cop or any sheriff get prosecuted for enacting civil asset forfeiture against an American who is minding his own business. You're not going to find any criminal action or criminal charges uh applied against a cop who abuses you at a traffic stop for the most most part sometimes does it happen yes but what ends up really happening is settlements happen the tax cattle end up paying and covering for that officer's bad actions and nothing happens to the officer as a matter of fact many times he gets a paid vacation called a suspension until we investigate ourselves and find out if there was any wrongdoing Leave your thoughts about this for the world and the global thought police in the comment section below. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon, give it a thumbs up, share it with everybody you know, subscribe to my email list through my website, highimpactflix.com. If you want to support the channel further, grab a shirt, become a channel member, but more importantly, know what your rights are, exercise your rights, flex your rights. If you don't use your rights, you will lose them. And believe me, there are plenty of psychopaths and uniforms with utility belts who want to take your rights away. You got to stand for them or they're gone. I will see you guys in the next video.